All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's just past four o'clock, time to start our monthly webinar. Um, thank you so much for joining. We have a nice quorum today. I see some familiar names and some that I have, I think most of you guys have seen before and some numbers, which I would not know who that is, but regardless, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we have a few nice cases today to show, um, and I know some people have to step out, so we'll give them some uh, priority to them to show first. But before we start, I got a few emails in the last couple of weeks um, asking how you can access the prior webinars that are recorded. So let me do that. Let me show um, you guys how to do that. All right. People, I think, can see my screen. So that's the NASCI website, uh, www.nasci.org. Um, and here you have a bunch of tabs at the top. You go on education, and a drop-down menu comes up. And you'll see there the Curious Cases webinars. When you click on that, it takes you to this page. And you can see prior webinars. Uh, it's the most recent one that's recorded. It's going to be highlighted here. Again, that was from the summer. Then we went to the meeting, so that month we didn't have one. And then you can go further back. Uh, at this point, we have about two years almost uh, worth of, of webinars, some really nice cases. Again, yeah, so some good stuff here, some good material for all of you to kind of go through starting in February of 2020, so almost two years now. Um, with that, um, I know Dr. Denny and Dr. Limanovich had to leave. Uh, Diana had one case, so why don't we ask her to join us and show her case. So Diana, I'm gonna make you presenter. You're gonna have to accept that. And go ahead and unmute yourself. You're still muted, Diana. All right. Well, Diana figures that out. Carol, are you ready to speak? Do you hear me, guys? I had issues with my computer. Now we hear you now. Okay. Go now ahead. you hear me. Wonderful because I didn't hear you and you didn't hear me, but now we are united. I'm glad, I'm ready. All right, so I, I made you presenter. You have to accept that to show your screen. Uh, I think I just inadvertently declined it. Can you make me presenter again? I can definitely try. Give me one second. Oh, you... Okay, let me see, hold on, share. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah, there you go. We Did have I see my screen. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, okay, let me just make it a. Um, let me just uh, try to make it a. Um, a PowerPoint view, but it doesn't work. Okay, do you still see the screen very well? It's relatively big images. I think we can leave it like this. Yeah, we see the image. Are you guys okay with that? Okay, wonderful. So this is a 57-year-old man with chest pain and family history of coronary artery disease. And we have four images uh, on display, all CT images. Uh, all are the images of this patient, three axial images. Uh, they are not consecutive, but they're going in the uh, craniocaudal direction and then a reconstructed uh, image or curved multiplanar reconstructed image of the LAD, okay? Same patient. So what we see here is severe osteostenosis of the right coronary artery. We can see it right here with a subsequent dilatation. And we also see a large moral feeling defect in the proximal vessel. And we can see this uh, moral feeling defect. So if we summarize those findings, we have a moderate stenosis in the proximal LED, and we have a dilated vessel and enhancing lumen 
partially with uh, a large feeling defect and overall a mass effect on the right atrium. So if we look at the uh, uh, volume rendering reconstructions, we can appreciate A, the narrowing of the right coronary artery, the dilatation of the right coronary artery, and the continuation of the right coronary artery. Now, if we look at the volume rendering, it actually demonstrates that the known pitfall of volume rendering in general, that we actually underestimate very often the size of the structure if it contains thrombus, because thrombus is not translated into the volume rendering if it's uh, done based on the density of the contrast. So all you see here is just contrast enhanced portion and the non-contrast enhanced portion is not seen. So technically this uh, is probably half of the actual size of the dilatation of the right coronary artery. So we saw the findings and then uh, the um, differential diagnosis that you see here is quite broad. You already see the answer, but I'm sure even without the spoiler alert, uh, you all would have picked atherosclerotic aneurysm and not congenital and not Kawasaki and not pseudoaneurysm and not saphenous vein bypass graft aneurysm. So let's, uh, let's talk about the aneurysms. So if we look at the aneurysm, so technically we talk about aneurysm versus ectasia. So what is aneurysm? Coronary segments which are one and a half times larger in diameter than adjacent normal segment, segment of the largest normal appearing coronary artery. And we talk about aneurysm involvement is less than 50% of the affected vessel length. If this is more, then we are talking about the ectasia. Now, atherosclerotic disease is the most common cause of a coronary aneurysm, definitely in the Western world. And RCA is, a, is affected more commonly in the LAD. So the right coronary artery aneurysm is the most common atherosclerotic aneurysm that you will see. And frequently, the aneurysms involve uh, more than one vessel. And also what is frequent to see is that if one vessel has an aneurysm, then the other coronary artery will have a substantial coronary artery disease, like in the case that I'm just showing, the patient has an RCA aneurysm and LAD uh, moderate uh, stenosis. So uh, this is uh, a, a, a companion case from radiographics where we can see ectatic right coronary artery with thrombus. Why ectatic? Because it's uh, more than 50% uh, of the vessel is involved and uh, you can appreciate the uh, overall appearance of the ectasia where we can see a substantial thrombus and we can see still the opacified lumen and that's how it would look it, it looked on the um, in, in, interventional coronary angiography so we see the right coronary artery we don't see the contrast medium within the lumen and interluminal thrombus that we also cannot see because it's not opacified so why we are searching for coronary aneurysms, so why we are uh, concerned about them, obviously they can be associated with neural thrombus formation. They could be distal embolization with uh, a subsequent even myocardial infarction, and they can also rapture and formate a fist, uh, and, and, and create a fistula to the adjacent cardiac structure, more commonly on the right than on the left, and uh, it will be the uh, fistula with the right atrium or right ventricle that will create essentially a left to right shunt. Now, discovery of the coronary aneurysm, since, uh, as we know, is usually incidental. When we are looking for coronary artery disease, we discover aneurysms. Uh, or sometimes uh, the patient has cross-sexual imaging done or echo done for completely other reason, and we discover atherosclerotic aneurysm. So we were talking so far about the native coronary artery aneurysms, atherosclerotic native coronary artery aneurysm. Uh, what I'm showing you now is a saphenous vein bypass graft aneurysm, different animal, uh, and it's different for two reasons. A, here what is aneurysmatic is not a coronary artery, but a bypass itself. Uh, those are uh, the, uh, the, the saphenous vein bypass is the one which is more prone to develop those aneurysms. And as you can see on this sort of a classic chest radiograph, which is uh, usually shown uh, and they're usually very similar to each other when we are having a um, left uh, side bypass aneurysm, large bump 
or large mass, which is adjacent to the cardiac silhouette and essentially inseparable from the cardiac silhouette. And on the cross-sectional imaging, we can appreciate the aneurysm and following it back and forth, we can see that this is involving the, uh, the bypass, the saphenous graft bypass. So um, this is a 3D uh, volume rendering of, uh, of this patient. And essentially, if we are talking about the saphenous bypass aneurysms, uh, we are talking about an aneurysm that develops years after the uh, bypass has been done. And this is different from a saphenous bypass pseudoaneurysms that usually develop within the first six months after surgery, and they're usually located in adjacent to the sutures. So what is done about those patients? So in terms of treatment, if the patient is asymptomatic, it's usually conservative management with antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy. If the aneurysm is large, and there's really not a good kind of point to say which one is treated conservatively and which ones are operated, but then uh, the approach will be surgical. Uh, and those are the native coordinates. And for the saphenous graft aneurysm, the approach is usually surgical. And that's what I wanted to talk about, talking about the native coronaries and saphenous bypass graft aneurysms. And thank you for letting me speak first. Any questions? Great case, Diana. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions, guys? All right. Seems like you're uh, off the hook, Diana. You can go to your meeting or. Yeah. Thank Perfect. you, guys. It was good to see everybody, even if those are just two letters of your first and last name on the panel. I can guess more of most of them. Perfect. Thank you. All Hi. right. Hi, Carol. You want to go Hi. next? Yeah. All right. Here you go. Okay. Perfect. We can okay. see your screen. You can see it? All right. First time I think I don't have to restart my computer. Okay. Perfect. All right. Got it now. So this is a 41 year old woman who had dyspnea and atypical chest pain um, or discomfort. She had well controlled asthma. Uh, she had she started with an echo that showed uh, some inferior uh, and apical hypokinesis and she came to MR. And Hmm, why aren't these starting? So what do we see on MR? We see, um, Sinny's is not running, but here it's just stopping, okay. Um, so we see uh, ventricular um, hypertrophy, so the myocardium appears thick. It's more than 10 millimeters. Uh, I think that the right ventricle is also uh, ha has a thick wall compared to normal. We see some areas of low intensity. This is done um, post contrast, these images. Um, and uh, then um, this is a dynamic perfusion run. Uh, it's done near the apex. You can see that there's a persistent uh, decrease perfusion of the endocardium of the apex or the segments of the left ventricle. And then um, these are the late GAD images. So there's intense subendocardial enhancement of the left and right ventricles, um, mainly limited to the apex for the left ventricle, but it doesn't have a vascular distribution. And then uh, the native T1 was 
very high at 1,148. The ECV was elevated and the, um, the T2 values were increased. So does anyone want to hazard a guess before I give you um, a clue from the patient's clinical history or lab? Eosinophilic endocarditis? Yes, of course, Prachi. <laughs> Good one. So yes, peripheral eosinophilia. She had significant peripheral eosinophilia. So we felt that this was a case of uh, eosinophilic uh, myocarditis. And she was, um, I'll talk about eosinophilic myocarditis in a few minutes, but she was treated with steroids. And this is her a month later, and she felt like a completely new person. Um, so pretty much everything has resolved. And even the perfusion in the same area looks almost normal, like that dark rim kind of disappears. So maybe it's not real. And this is her late GAD on at the one month follow up. So there's still some enhancement at uh, in the apical segments of the left ventricle, um, and probably a bit at the apex and along the anterior wall of the right ventricle. And um, oh, I did have her her um, uh, T1 mapping was down. Native T1 was down to 1,045. Her ECV was down to 32, and T2 mapping uh, was normal on the one-month follow-up. So there's three histologic types of myocarditis. Uh, the one that we know the, the most is lymphocytic, and that's the one that's most often caused by viruses. Giant cell is very uncommon and very aggressive, um, leading to heart failure. And eosinophilic myocarditis is also not common at all. Um, it can be idiopathic uh, due to Loeffler's endocarditis, and we thought uh, we couldn't find anything in this patient uh, in that although she had uh, stable uh, asthma, well-controlled, uh, she did not have church strauss um, She had not ingested anything, reacted to any kind of drug. Um, they did a bone marrow on her and couldn't find any uh, neoplastic uh, disorders, no he hematologic disorders. Uh, so we felt this was uh, idiopathic. Um, so how does it, uh, what occurs there when you get uh, eosinophilic myocarditis, you get an eosinophil mediated damage to the subendocardium. And this leads to necrosis, thrombosis, and eventually may lead to late stage endomyocardial fibrosis of both ventricles. So I think in this case, we were at the, at the, the, the stage of necrosis and maybe thrombosis in that some of those um, small dark areas, we weren't sure whether they were small thrombi on the, um, on the endocardium. So they did put her on, um, anticoagulants as well. And the clinical manifestations can be congestive heart failure, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and then thromboembolic phenomena because of the uh, necrosis and thrombosis. And the treatment is steroids as uh, happened in this, um, this individual. So what do we see on MR? We see mid to apical concentric uh, thickening on SSFP uh, cines. And the late gadolinium enhancement sequence, we see intense subendocardial enhancement that's not limited to a vascular uh, territory. So in this patient, that's what we saw. We saw actually it was more uh, um, not just uh, apical and mid, it was really concentric thickening of both the left and right ventricles. Um, her uh, ejection fraction and volumes were normal, but there was a bit of hypokinesia in the inferior wall and apex. Um, and what we did not really see is these biventricular apical uh, thrombi. Um, and this is another uh, patient. Uh, this case was given to me by Elsie Wynn, who's another um, member of NASCI. Uh, and she had a more restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy at this point, 
progressive to uh, an endomyocardial fibrosis, but you can see a, a large left apical thrombus here, and there's subendocardial enhancement here in a non-vascular distribution. And then finally, I have another patient here who did have severe asthma and respiratory failure with an elevation in troponins, arrhythmias, and left heart failure. She had peripheral eosinophilia and a positive P-ANCA, and she had um, what looks like kind of organizing pneumonia in, in her lungs. Um, and this patient had uh, Turg Strauss and on MR, maybe not the, the most classic uh, case, um, but she, she had poor uh, um, uh, left ventricular uh, function uh, and uh, enhancement, uh, really not as typical as I just showed you in those last two cases, but we felt that she had some, this is an older case and we thought she had some um, enhancement in the um, left ventricle. So um, that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you, Carol. Those are really nice cases. Let's see, there's a, there's a comment in the chat box. Uh, okay. Oh, say so somebody uh, who has cases to present, and we're more than happy to show cases from okay. another call. So that's great. Um, so actually, uh, uh, Diraj, you you want to go next and show your case? Oh, thank you. So it will be a very very short case. So uh, how do I? I'm making you a presenter. You're gonna, you, you're gonna accept to be the presenter, and then you're gonna share your screen. Okay. Uh, so accessibility features. Uh, do I? Oh, it is okay. So. Uh, okay, so screen or oh, open system preferences. I don't know why it is not letting me share my screen. Okay, it it it, it has happened in the past with uh, with some others. Um, Carol, it has happened hey. to you, right? You had. Uh, I I think it's in your privacy. Um... I can't remember how, how you do it. it. It's telling you what, uh, what message is it giving you? It's saying that uh, it's saying that uh, go, uh, go to meetings needs uh, to use accessibility features. And when I go to open system preferences, it goes to accessibility, but uh, privacy and somehow Okay, I, I'll not like to waste your time. I, I'll try to figure it out okay, if perfect. someone else has a case. Yeah, you might need to leave the meeting and then come back in. After you, yeah. Okay. okay. I can show okay. two I, very quick cases, Jacobo. They're certainly not as polished as Diana's and uh, Carol's, but... I'm sure they're great cases, Greg, and I'm making you a presenter right now, and, and they don't have to be quick. We have time. Oh. <laughs> we don't have an option. They will be quick. So... All right, here we go. Let me share. Location. PowerPoint share. Okay. All right. Okay. So these were. Um. This was a. Um. Uh. uh these are two interesting cases that I had. Uh. We scanned recently that I just thought would be interesting to put together to show people just as an example. Um. <clears throat> this was a, a 19 year old patient who who uh, was uh, being referred to us evaluate uh, their aortic valve. Um, you can see they had this uh, very thickened and dysfunctional aortic valve. It was, it was a cardiac CT examination, and so there wasn't any functional data, and we did not do a cardiac MRI in this patient. Um, but I've seen aortic valves like this in young patients who have uh, hyperlipidemia syndromes. Uh, that was not the case in this patient. This patient had something called uh, a geophysic uh, dysplasia, um, which is basically uh, a, a mucopolysaccharidosis. Uh, it has been in the old literature called uh, atypical uh, gargalism because the, the patients have these, um, uh, they have short stature and, and, and uh, skeletal changes that uh, you know, are disfiguring. And so that, that's a term that's in the older literature. Um, it, 
in terms of their symptoms, they have these short statures and they will have uh, cardiac valvular disease is just part of this uh, genetic uh, syndrome. Uh, and most commonly the mitral valve disease is, uh, th is uh, thickened um, and uh, dysfunctional followed by uh, aortic pulmonary and tricuspid. This patient only had aortic valve disease, which was, which was a little bit unusual, uh, but I just wanted to show it as an interesting case. Um, uh, obviously, it's clear from a patient like this, they present with a history, uh, you know, based on this physical presentation that you, you would immediately start going to some sort of uh, uh, congenital uh, disease in a patient like this, but just as an interesting example. Then I just wanted to show one other case. This is what sort of brought this, uh, made me show this first case. Hold on. There we go. Uh, this was the case that we uh, imaged uh, just recently. Uh, uh, that I want to show. And this is a case of Dannon disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease. This was actually a pr patient who, when she was around 31, uh, during her pregnancy, she was having palpitations and she had uh, an echo. So this is a patient who had no, you know, nobody was alerted that there was anything wrong with this patient. She had uh, palpitations. Uh, the echo showed LV dilation and wall thinning, and then on genetic screening, she was shown to have a LAMP2 mutation, and that is a mutation in a, uh, a protein related to lysosomal storage. And those patients, these patients with Dan disease can often have very severe hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, although it's not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the cardiomyopathy, but they, they have they have diffuse hypertrophy, but their ejection fraction is completely preserved. It's it's not it's not a low ejection fraction like you would see in amyloid. It's not a increased ejection fraction like you would see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's just a normal ejection fraction over time. And this woman, by the time we imaged her, was in her 40s. Um, they progress to a dilated cardiomyopathy. So she's in between those phases now. And I just thought this was very really quite a unique look. It doesn't even look like a burned out hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's really just quite a unique look. Um, and this is uh, Dannon disease. So, and that's it. Those are my two cases. And those are really good cases too. Unusual. <laughs> that, no, it's fantastic. Great. No, thanks for sharing. I, I don't recall ever seeing those gargoyle appearing uh, leaflets. Yes. All right, any comments or questions, guys? All right. Uh, Diraj, you want to see if we can try it back? I see that you re-signed with a different entry. Let's see if I can make you presenter. Okay, I restarted and get permission. All right, let's see. Okay, so it says screen. So uh, I'll publish main screen. You see my screen for Yes, we do. Okay. So I think this will be a simple case, a straightforward probably. So this is a 57-year-old uh, female uh, presented with embolic right foot ischemia. Uh, so there was some concern for intracardiac shunt with uh, echocardiography and bubble study. And we did the CT scan. So I focused it mainly in this area because the abnormality is shown here. So we can either go from top or we can either go from bottom. So if we start from inferior vena cava, so look at the inferior vena cava and when we go higher, higher, we see that it is continuous both to the left atrium and also to the right atrium. So this is a type of atrial septic defect. And this is sinus venosus atrial septal defect. So we often see superior sinus venosus uh, atrial septic defect, um, but th this is not quite common for to see inferior sinus venosus atrial septic defect. So we did the MR, so that shows nicely the inferior vena cava, and which is continuous with the left atrium and also the right atrium and the septum is deficient there. So this is inferior sinus venosus atrial septal defect. And we all know that atrial septal defects are associated with 
um, another abnormality that we can see on this CT, and the same CT that we did for the uh, I showed earlier. So that so this right upper lobe pulmonary vein draining into the superior vena cava. So this is a inferior sinus venous CSD with right upper lobe pulmonary vein partial anomalous drainage to the superior vena cava. So I thought this is an interesting case. Any question? What, how commonly is the inferior sinus stenosis defect associated with another anomaly? Is it, is it like it is with yeah. the su superior? Yeah, so I tried to look at the literature, like how common the inferior uh, sinus stenosis is the shows the partial anomalous. There is not much report on that. So it's uh, most of the cases we saw superior uh, kind of sinus venous, as you said, commonly associated with the right upper lower uh, uh, partial anomalous venous drainage. But this was somewhat atypical uh, case, I think. Uh, I, I didn't see any report saying that significant association, but uh, that has been reported that partial anomalous any type can be associated with uh, any pattern of partial, uh, any pattern of uh, sinus venosus ASD. But the incidence, I couldn't find any literature on that. Thank you. Great case. That's a great case. Yeah, we don't see this one at all. Sure. Thanks. Uh -huh. All right. Anybody else? So I'll stop sharing then. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Diraj. Um, anybody else who would like to share a case? I can show a quick one too. It's it's just two slides, but it's interesting. Let me make you present there. Thank you, Prachi. So this was just a regular chest CT being read for a totally different reason. I can't recollect what the reason was, but if you look at this image of the heart, what is striking, and even though we don't like to call left ventricular hypertrophy beyond a non-gated CT because we don't exactly know which phase of the cardiac cycle it is, but the myocardium is exceedingly heterogeneous. So you can see this, this was picked up. I think it was a great uh, call by one of my colleagues because I can't imagine when we're reading oncology scans to pick up this kind of a pattern on myocardium is exceedingly rare. But um, went ahead and we did an MRI. I was very intrigued what this would turn out to be. And this is what it looks like. So very typical appearance for amyloid. I just have never seen amyloid on a contrast enhanced CT with the, uh, you know, we tried delayed enhancement on CT and it's really hard to pick up, but in this case, it was just done as a non-gated CT for other reasons. And um, it was just striking the way we picked up delayed enhancement. It is pretty striking. Uh, yeah. can, you go, can you go back to the first image real quick and then, and now flip forward again? Isn't it funny how the area that is enhancing in the LGE is the is the uh, low attenuation area on the CT? Yeah, I would just caution it because uh, this was a non-gated CT, so it wasn't really possible to uh, totally co-register one thing versus another. Okay. But, yeah, but it was exceeding. I was thinking it might turn out to be HCM, but you know, or amyloid or whatever. But I really had never seen a heterogeneously enhancing myocardium on a regular chest CT. And that's that's a regular portal venous phase, right? That's not like a yeah, yeah. delay as we usually yeah. do more. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting. Yeah, so this was this is just kind of one of those things that we see more and more of this. I think we need to be cognizant. Yeah. And it looks like, and it's funny because the hypo, the low attenuation area in the myocardium is is matching closer to skeletal muscle than the 
that uh, the brighter area in the myocardium. So this makes it seem like the enhance it's an abnormal enhancement as opposed to or something. Yeah, exactly. And it's very thick too. So yeah. well, the myocardium looks very there, uh, Greg, Greg, there's such a thing, right? Um, when you look at the amyloid cases, that there's uh, it's a vasculopathy too, right? There's thickening of the microvascular tube as well. That's why you can have that, that those uh, microinfarcts in amyloid and that very subendocardial kind of late enhancement. So maybe that's part of what is going on here. There's just oh, maybe yeah. Well, contrast getting to that subendocardium there. Mm -hmm. well, who knows? Awesome. That's a great case, Brachi. Thanks for sharing. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I did not. I was telling the, the folks uh, earlier. Uh, I did not get a chance to put the case that I wanted to show together. But uh, after seeing um, Carol's presentation, I remember that I, I did have a case. It's a nice. Uh, it's an old case from like eight years ago, and I just found it. Um, so let me share it with you because I think it's a nice companion case to the ones that she was showing of myocarditis. Um, so let me just put this in play mode. And it's not working like this. I need to, sorry, I need to share the my screen, not the application. Uh, let's share my screen. And that should work. So, 48-year-old male, uh, no significant past medical history, presenting a direct transfer to the cardiac cath uh, for evaluation of presumed high-risk MI. Uh, very active patient, works in construction. Um, Ten days prior, he began to have low-grade fever, chills, cough, uh, malaise, uh, sharp pain, or chest discomfort, without radiation to to the neck or the left arm. Um, he was started on ciprofloxacin for pneumonia back then. Uh, symptoms worsened, and then uh, he finally came for evaluation. There was a troponin that was to be elevated, and there were some findings on EKG, specifically some runs of non-sustained uh, VT. So he was emergently transferred to the CAT lab, and his coronaries were pretty basically clean, but again, it's a young, a healthier patient otherwise. Uh, however, he's left ventricular ejection fraction on the LV gram was uh, around 30%, so significantly di diminished. Um, a bedside echo reveal um, heart failure by ventricular with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 20% and global hypokinesis. Uh, oh, shoot. So let's see if this plays. No. Well, just shows a dilated cardiomyopathy here. Again, sorry, I just kind of pulled this case um, after seeing Carol. So it's an old case. I, I need to relink to the movies, but uh, global hypokinesis. Some of the same. Again, this is just a short axis going through, so you're going to have to trust me on that. Just dilated um, cardiomyopathy with global hypokinesis. Um, this is a T2 with it image or a double inversion recovery image. Um, again, these are very hard to get good homogeneous uh, look of the myocardium. So there is some question of some areas of uh, increased signal intensity, maybe here by the septum and some here in the anterior wall, but maybe even here, again, it's just very difficult to get good uh, quality images that are diagnostic T2 images of the heart. Perfusion was normal. And these are the late enhancement images. And you can see there's uh, subendocardial enhancement pretty much on both sides of the heart, kind of patchy on this four chamber view. Uh, similar, pretty epicardial here on this towards the base here on this two chamber view, um, and definitely not transmural, so just the uh, sub epicardial images. And again, um, uh, EP was consulted for temporary pacing wires because of the sustained VTAX um, and the third degree AP block. And at the same time, uh, it was uh, taking the opportunity to do a biopsy of the myocardium. And this is what the biopsy looked like. And I'm not even going to pretend to be a pathologist. Anybody here wants to say something about this? Okay, just there's a huge inflammatory reaction to it. Uh, you can see all of those uh, 
uh, cells with the dark nuclei around the actual myocytes. These are the myocytes more elongated with the central nuclei, more, more like orange pinkish. And you have this with a very dark nuclei surrounding all of them. So a large inflammatory uh, component. Uh, this is from the PAD report. Uh, so the biopsy discloses a marked infiltrate of chronic inflammatory cells, including lymphocytes, histocytes, and eosinophils. Um, and the histocytes aggregate in poorly formed granulomas. There are also multinuclear giant cells present, and that's key. Um, so these histocytic and giant cells are the hallmark of giant cell myocarditis, which is the other type of myocarditis that Carol was mentioning earlier she was mentioning a uh, lymphocytic she mentioned also uh, giant cell um, again this is that case of giant cell myocarditis so very quickly giant cell myocarditis is a rare highly lethal disorder um, there's very few cases uh, reported uh, in the literature all of them are either fatal or managed with heart transplantation until um, triple drug immunosuppression was reported to help with to treat the GCM. Again, autopsy studies conducted a number of years ago in England and Japan reported the incidence of GCM as high as 23.4 per 100,000 cases or 6.6 .6 per 100,000 cases. And I, I don't recall the exact population of these autopsies. Um, in the past, GCM and sarcoidosis were kind of grouped together probably because of those poorly formed granulomas that you can see on the biopsy. But again, it has been recognized that they have different clinical and histological features. Um, sarcoidosis will have more of those granulomas and more fibrosis, while parent cell myocarditis will have more necrosis and eosinophils. Again, it's a rapid acute uh, disease that progresses quickly, uh, while sarcoid will take months to years to really progress. So again, also clinically, the progression can help differentiate this. Uh, biopsy is the standard for the diagnosis, of course. And should be considered in younger patients with the hepatic heart block to diagnose uh, GCM, especially if you can prove with imaging that there's cardiomyopathy present. Um, about MRI, not a perfect alternative because uh, is the information is less detailed in contrast to biopsy. Again, so basically what we can say is that the patient may have a inflammation of, of the heart or myocarditis, but it's really hard to say specifically that this is giant cell or not. For that, we would need a biopsy. And that's pretty much it. Again, I just remember I had that one case. I wanted to show it to kind of complete the cases that Carol was showing earlier. And let's see, there's a comment here in the chat box. Oh, yeah, somebody was thinking sarcoidosis, which, again, great thought. Um, but the biopsy proved us uh, wrong and towards the diagnosis of uh, giant cell myocarditis. Any... Any questions about this case or you guys recall seeing giant cell myocarditis? Because again, it's, it's, it's a pathology a pathology diagnosis. So we may be just looking at the MRI saying myocarditis and if we don't follow up with all of these. And again, the vast majority are just going to be the lymphocytic viral kind. But if we don't follow up on this, we may have seen a few that we just never knew they were giant cell myocarditis. All right, everybody's very quiet. So that's the case. Um, anything uh, Anything else, uh, guys? Anything anybody wants to show? Any more cases out there? All right, well, thank you so much for joining us for our monthly um, case webinar. Again, I, I think this new schedule of Mondays is working a little bit better than the the past schedule we have more people every month showing up so again thank you for coming feel free to come and show your own cases again this is how we all learn uh, from each other uh, this is a very uh, benign environment for sure so again thank you guys and uh, hope to see you all all soon thank you thank you great thanks so much